What does exist, however... Did you hear that? Why? Not a bad start. We're back with another pre-built systems review. This is the Asus GL10DH. This thing was $1,400. It looks bad. If you look at the front, the, the side and back, the, the other side, but but it's not as bad thermally as it looks. Asus actually impressed us with it for what it is because it ends up being a negative pressure setup that's used really well. This thing has a 3700X. It's got a 1660 Ti that comes in it. Two sticks of RAM. We're uh, in the upper echelon now, and not a lot of companies do that. And at $1,400, it lands it right in the middle of a bunch of the other systems we've reviewed from pre-built manufacturers. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So first of all, our criteria for buying this one, when we went shopping for another people to buy, we did what we've always done for this entire series thus far, which is look for something that is not configured custom by the end user. We want to buy stuff still, at least for now, for this series, this version of this series, that is completely pre-assembled. They give you a list of parts on the website. You click buy. It's pretty much that simple. So in other words, we're avoiding things where it's a uh, handcrafted custom service that's maybe a little more boutique in style because we're kind of going for what does the mass market user buy, and then we want to review it and see if it's actually any good so we can steer people away from things that wouldn't work well for them and towards things that should be a better fit. So that's what we did for this. We've got a whole series on it. Playlist is in the description below. I'm not going to talk through the entire recap of what we looked at so far, but we've been impressed by two. One was from SkyTech and one was from ABS. That was the Challenger, which is $1,000. It's a fierce competitor for this thing. This is $1,400. That puts it just below uh, the HP Pavilion, which was $1,430 that we reviewed, and the $1,050 Lenovo T5 that we reviewed just above it. As we get into the benchmarks for these things, just a quick note that we buy all these pre built ourselves. If you'd like to support us as we continue to spend many thousands of dollars on pre-built systems of questionable quality, some of them have been good, then you can go to store.gamersaccess.net and grab something like one of our Teardown Toolkits. These are in stock and shipping now. They were out of stock and on back order for months and months. They're finally back. It's a 10-piece high-quality toolkit. It's been tuned for component disassembly and reassembly work. Of course, you could use it for standard PC building as well. Uh, and it'll excel with things like GPU disassembly, repasting components, water block installation, things of that nature, and just building and maintaining a computer. Okay, let's start out with the teardown, and then we'll go from there. Thermals are going to be interesting on this one. So this is the system. You've seen it at this point, but at this point in the video, I have not actually looked internally yet. Uh, the front is obviously the biggest thing that concerned us when we first bought this case. It is completely lacking and really any type of access to air. This is just, it's all plastic. It looks like it's got a little bit of dents, but it is not a clear path for air to get in. And so there's nothing on the bottom. There's nothing on the top, nothing on the sides here. There's no air getting in the front at all. What does exist, however, did you hear that? I'm thinking that's not supposed to be making that noise. Uh, so we have a loose screw. I mean, like a lot of them, but there's a loose screw specifically in this computer. Uh, the side has ventilation on it, and that's about the most that you can ask for for ventilation on this case. Let's see what the rattling is. Well, that was uh, anticlimactic. Okay. Loose screws are bad in computers because uh, it could potentially short something. And oh, there it is somewhere. Oh, got it. Become like a magician. <laughs> All right, so let's take a closer look internally. So far, what we're seeing is a standard form factor motherboard, so that's great news. Asus makes motherboards. This is probably one of the least surprising things of the build. 
the power supply. So we've got an EPS 12 volt cable over here. This is actually really taut. Probably should be a little bit more slack there, uh, just so it doesn't strain it and ship any things. But anyway, that's a standard eight pin cable. Standard 24 pin cable down here, which as you can see on our mod mat over here, and these are back in stock on the store as well if you want one for PC building service. But standard 24 pin follows this pin out exactly. The CP power EPS 12 volt follows this exactly. So, so far we're in good shape. Power supply does not appear to be proprietary. That's sadly great news. In the back we have not a 120 millimeter fan. So there is a one fan in this whole friggin' thing, and it looks like it's a 90 mil fan for exhaust. There's another about the same size for the CPU tower cooler, which appears to be uh, an AMD, old, old AMD stock cooler. Okay. So it claims an 80 plus gold E500 power supply from Great Wall. People like to jump on the name Great Wall because I guess low hanging fruit, but just to be clear, they do actually manufacture a good portion of the power supplies on the market, including Corsairs. So Great Wall is a supplier. Uh, they supply a lot of the big name brands that you buy from anyway. And um, oh, actually they made the uh, the Walmart one. That's it. They, they made uh, the Walmart DTW power supply and that was actually the only thing that wasn't terrible in that computer. Anyway, they're capable of making bad stuff too, but I just pointed out that this is a, a common supplier because people kind of jump on the jump on it over the name which is just kind of effortless. There should be a little more research in it than that. Yeah, one screw could have done the job of all of this plastic. And half this plastic's probably gonna break. Oh, that's interesting, okay. What the hell are they doing? <laughs> what the fuck? It's just like, this is like an arts and crafts project. What? All right, okay, so why? Okay, so there's some, I think, LED control up here. Any I.O.? There's, no, there's no I.O. That's going to be all LED stuff, so I'm going to disconnect that. Ow. That is sharp. Ow. <laughs> okay. That's great. Nice. Nice, not reusable sheet of adhesive. I'm so con I think it's just to reflect the LEDs or something. I don't know. I think they're trying to reflect the LEDs or create a darker back so that the lights look cooler or something. Anyway, we'll put that back. Time to start taking apart the rest of this. How's that look? Well, those are useless. You can tell this is a chassis that's been retooled. Well, not even retooled. That's not been retooled. You can tell this is a chassis they're reusing and sticking a different front on it. Let's see if we have one skinny enough to get in through here. Nice. I'm not sure this is the right order of operations, but it is going to work. Oh, hey, look at that. That's exactly the screw that was loose earlier. That's this one right here. Check that out right there. That's the same screw. I think I understand why it was loose now. If you have to install it this way, I don't think you do. It's got, there's gotta be a different way to do that. And I see this screw here. I, I didn't think it was attached in a way that, let's see, maybe it's, maybe it's important. Oh yeah, that is actually changing something. Okay. So these, I'll go to this thing. There you go. There's the GPU support bracket. There's the front of the GPU support bracket. There's the video card itself. These are not, those support brackets, if you're kind of new to computers, you don't need those in a DIY system. They can definitely be useful in OEM systems. It's easy to make fun of them, but, uh, but they're genuinely useful because if they're going to ship it with the card installed uh, and they aren't going to put foam in it, then it's going to break the card. So, and maybe the PCIe slot. So, a lot of plastic here. This is a 1660 Ti. Uh, 1660 Ti, fortunately, not a big demander for cooling and airflow. So that one's 
going to do better in this case than a higher end GPU might. So that's going to be it for the teardown of this. We're going to get into some of the charts and benchmarks now. Overall, teardown recap for you here. The only major thing that was concerning was the loose screw. Uh, it was part of the, the GPU assembly for the GPU support that holds it in place during shipping and later. I mean, it stays in there. So it's part of this. Um, maybe not tight enough. Maybe they missed when they were trying to screw it in. I don't know. But that's a big problem, obviously, because as that rattles around, there's a pretty good chance it ends up somewhere lodged in the motherboard or the backside of the board, whatever, and cause a direct short, and then you, you blow it. So that's not great to see. We've run into it a lot in the past uh, with pre-builds. Some of it could be shipping. Some of it's just carelessness. But either way, only major issue. Now, there, we have plenty of issues with the design of the chassis, but I'll isolate those to sort of the thermal section. For assembly quality, build quality, I didn't see any major things to complain about. Uh, it's got standard motherboard form factor, holes and mounting and everything. has a standard video card, has a standard power supply. I could take this power supply from this pre-built and put it in another computer right now and it would work just fine. So that's all good. And overall ASUS is at least in good standing with us for using things that aren't stupid and proprietary and useless and destined to a landfill the minute something else stops working in the system. It, it sucks to throw away eight components when one of them dies. So uh, overall, not a bad start. Uh, thermals, we'll see how it does. The case leaves a lot to be desired, but maybe the components are low end enough in a sense where it works out. Let's get into some of the benchmarks and see how it does. In Cyberpunk 2077, the Strix averaged 70 FPS, putting it 6% ahead of the Legion T5 system. And that was our highest scoring 1660 Super pre-built. The lowest scoring 2060 Super system, which was the $1,430 HP Pavilion, was 29% ahead of Asus. That means the HP Pavilion with the 2060 Super ended up costing just 3% more in exchange for a massive 29% more performance. Despite the Pavilion's many other issues, like, for example, excessive bloatware and proprietary non-transferable parts, the computer is actually far superior in value for this gaming test versus the ROG Strix. For another comparison, the Asus ROG Strix is 33% more expensive than the Legion T5 and the 1660 Super in that one. Yet the Legion T5 achieves at 95% of the average FPS throughput offered by the Asus box. There's one key advantage though. The ROG Strix smoothed over the 0.1% lows here, meaningfully actually, and noticeably improving the frame pacing and reducing the chance of jarring hitches during gameplay. So there is still a benefit despite sort of having most of the average FPS. Red Dead is up next. The ASUS system ran at 64 FPS average in Red Dead 2 at 1080p high, which matched its average FPS with the ABS Challenger, both at about 64 FPS average while struggling in the lows for ASUS. The ASUS system held a 24 FPS 0.1% low versus the Challenger's 40 FPS for this metric. That means that the frame time pacing is all over the place on the ASUS system, with more chance of longer hitches or potentially noticeable stutter between frames. This frame time pacing is largely correlated with things we've seen in the past, like use of single channel configurations for memory, as seen in many of the single stick builds. Now this one does have two sticks of RAM, but they're not particularly good quality, and there are other issues like the bloatware that's in the system, which we'll get to in a little bit, and the fact that Red Dead during the reign of the Ryzen 3000 series was one of the few places where Intel consistently placed well while Ryzen had trouble. But for this one, it comes down, we think, mostly to the quality of the RAM and to the background tasks and bloatware. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p Ultra is next, tested with our CPU-heavy settings, and we saw the ASUS system running at 202 FPS average. This gave the Strix a 1.6% advantage over the ABS Challenger that we liked previously. That's unnoticeable as an advantage, but it cost 39% more for performance differences that only testing software will detect. For comparison to others, the $1,400 ASUS system is led by the $1,430 HP Pavilion system by 6%. Although the Pavilion drops some of the frame time consistency at the low end, the overall performance is still more than sufficient for this game. We start seeing real gains at the $1,800 price tier with the Alienware Aurora. We don't recommend that build to be 
extremely clear. It was an insulting yet beautiful ensemble of bullshit that'll outlive humanity with its many millimeters of plastic strapped to a decades-old chassis that'll one day be stuck in a landfill rotting for millions of years, but it ran 70% higher average FPS in exchange for 30% more money than the Strix. In the very least, it helps illustrate the upper bound. At 1440p, the workload imposes a GPU bottleneck due to the resolution increase. Even still, everything on the bench is completely capable of playing Rainbow Six at 1440p. You'll find a lot of games that can be played at 1440, even on this 1660 Ti tier hardware you see in the stack, especially if you're willing to forego some of the higher graphics settings. The Strix holds 130 FPS average. That's more than playable, even for a game that is historically more of sort of super high FPS requirement territory, and it's got 90 FPS for the lows. That's also good. The ABS Challenger, though, does put it to shame, with nearly identical performance while costing $400 less. The Lenovo Legion could nearly claim the same, except Lenovo decided to cap its performance by cheaping out with one stick of RAM. The HP Pavilion is a meaningful 25% uplift in average FPS for $40 more, and that's thanks to the upgrade to the 2060 Super here. This is where the GPU really becomes important because we're at that higher resolution. Time to test the thermals on this closed off case. The single case fan is a rear exhaust fan and the downdraft CPU cooler is right next to the side panel vent. Meanwhile, there's the blower style GPU cooler, which also contributes further to this being a negative pressure layout. To be clear, airflow in the system still isn't good, <laughs> but Asus has made an attempt to at least encourage intake via the side from negative pressure and to some extent from that hole on the bottom at the front. The acrylic side panel has no vent, but it uses standoffs that hold it slightly away from the chassis and leave a small air gap. Bizarrely, the stock metal side panel also has holes drilled in it, and it can be mounted on the same standoffs, although doing so makes it look like the case is falling apart. Here's the results then. In the full stock configuration, T-Dye peaked at 86 degrees Celsius and held at about 85. The GPU temperature held a constant 67 degrees C with a 79 degree hotspot. That's all fine. It's not great on the CPU, but everything's acceptable. Taking the front panel off entirely didn't do much because the case is set up for negative pressure and it has no active intake in the front. So although there are no holes, there's also nothing trying to push air through holes. So it doesn't really matter in this regard. T-Dio is about 84 degrees, GPU is about 68. Swapping in the acrylic side panel with the standoffs resulted in a steady state CPU temperature of 86 degrees in controlled conditions. The GPU temperature leveled out at 71 with a hot spot of 83, demonstrating the value of a side vent for everything, but GPU cooling in this case especially. The bottom line is that cooling is sufficient, which is a bar that many pre-builds actually do fail to clear, so this is a good thing here. Whether intentional or not, the components in this system have been arranged to work together and avoid thermal throttling. It's a properly set up negative pressure configuration. One more critical note though, the fan behavior in this system became inconsistent after we connected to the internet. We do all of our thermal tests before connecting to the internet or altering bio settings for exactly this reason. The thermal results we've just shown are out of box numbers. We do have results with the new, more aggressive fan behavior gathered during noise testing, but they're barely any better than the stock numbers due to diminishing returns, so we won't bother showing them. Talking about fan ramp then, the GL10DH comes with one 90 mil case fan and an 80 mil CPU fan. The maximum possible speed of the CPU fan is 4200 RPM, while the case fan maxes out at 3000 RPM. Both fans are set to the standard curve in BIOS. Under load, the chassis fan ran at effectively its max speed when T-Die hit 86C, while the CPU fan ramps to 3200 RPM, which is obviously less than its max. This is still sufficient to keep the CPU from dropping clocks during thermal tests, but in later testing, the CPU did reach its maximum speed under load. We're almost completely certain that this is due to Asus's Armory Crate update that was applied after connecting to the internet. It happened without any input from us, so it's still stock behavior, but it was definitely not a desired change. The fan curve became much sharper and more abrupt, going from approximately 23 minutes to reach steady state, max speed, and the original torture test down to about 34 seconds in the new one. We don't have noise logs from before the fan behavior changed, but the system became much louder afterward with audible hysteresis and varied workloads like games. This can be seen in some of the RPM logging we showed earlier. We use a consistent torture workload for noise testing, and in that scenario, we logged a sustained noise level of 46.6 dBA, 
which puts it on the louder end of the chart. Time for power consumption benchmarks. For these, we measure at the wall rather than at the cables since we're testing the full system power consumption and efficiency. The Ryzen 3700X in this system doesn't switch between power levels under sustained load in the same way that many Intel CPUs do. So the full system power draw with the Blender CPU workload was a constant 140 watts. That puts it in a competitive position against 1660 super equipped systems with higher end Intel CPUs. The Lenovo Legion, for example, had a short term power draw that was 221 watts thanks to its i7-10700. The Intel 10400 and 1660 super systems like the Dell G5-5000 and the ABS Challenger are roughly equivalent in power draw to the GL10DH an overall win for the 3700X and, by extension, ASUS, given its advantage over the 6-core, 12-thread, 10400, and multi-threaded tasks. The efficiency is better on the ASUS build. Power drawn Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p Ultra and Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p Medium was nearly identical. It's 207 to 206 watts for each, and that's below the ABS Challenger's averages, although the GL10DH has a slight edge in some gaming performance. Thanks to the 3700X here, ASUS's system looks great on these power charts. Time to talk about setup and instructions. There was no quick start guide or indication of how to get one digitally, nor were there any warnings against using the onboard video ports rather than the GPU's ports. This may not seem like a big deal, but it is the literal first thing that someone needs to know when they're setting up the computer, and the barrier to entry for pre-builds has to be as low as possible. Otherwise, the experience becomes frustrating for new users will be even more frustrated when they sit on hold for an hour, only to be told that they plugged the cable into the wrong spot. That's assuming ASUS doesn't install a capacitor backwards. The system contained no internal packing foam. It's more excusable than usual because of the overkill rock-solid GPU support and small CPU cooler, but even lightweight systems can suffer shipping damage. It's not like ASUS wants to avoid all possible reasons for opening the case either, because they ship an entire alternate acrylic side panel in the box. Although this is kind of a, a neat gimmick to include with it, it's a questionable one, because the panel really only reveals a big steel bar for GPU support in the inside of a chassis that was designed probably in the early 2000s. The GL10DH motherboard maintains standard mounting holes that fit micro ATX and ATX spacing, despite technically not being a micro ATX or mini ITX board, and the board has a B450 chipset, so thus far it's mostly standard. The CPU is a 3700X, obviously also standard, yet there are no options whatsoever for overclocking in BIOS, not even for memory. These settings are inherited from AMD's AGISA. So ASUS is actually intentionally including them from BIOS here. That stated, Ryzen Master still functions normally, but with the cooler that's included in this thing, we wouldn't recommend using it for much of an overclock anyway. The most useful thing it would be for is maybe under volting or some kind of other tuning to help with thermals and noise. The installed RAM is rated for DDR4-2666. It lacks XMP. There's no profile saved to the kit. So that's the speed it'll run out of the box, period. Also, BIOS doesn't let you change it anyway, so... That's where you're stuck. Other than capacity, the RAM specs aren't listed on the kits, but they are listed on the product page. It's slow, really slow memory, but that's what we ordered and that's what we got. So Asus was at least truthful in its marketing, which is a rare thing with memory and pre-builds. As usual for a pre-built from a large company, the GL10DH comes loaded with bloatware. The Windows setup process asks for registration information for support and protection. Honestly, sounds like it's asking for protection money here, but okay, we'll go with it. This can be skipped technically, but there's no indication at all on the screen that it is skippable, just like protection money. <laughs> this information can conveniently be provided to McAfee and the My Asus app, which sounds like a great idea. There's a boatload of first-party Armory Creighton Aura bloatware bullshit installed in addition to my Asus, but the number of obnoxious pop-ups, surprisingly, was pretty small. The Asus apps are at least arguably relevant to the system, sort of. Our biggest gripe, though, is the unavoidable Armory Crate app that applies profiles that countermand BIOS settings. The pre-installed NVIDIA driver was 452.06 from August of 2020, if the event viewer logs are accurate, then the system was last booted in January of 2021. So it's actually kind of surprising. This has been sitting on a shelf for a really long time. As we wrap this up then, you know, it's it impressed us. We honestly, we went into this when Patrick and I chose this system and Keegan actually was involved in looking for this one as well. The reason we pulled the trigger on this one was because the... 
I mean, the front of it, if we're just being honest, it looked like it was going to be a 100 degrees Celsius box. We thought we were going to get something where we run a game and the CPU is at 100 degrees or the GPU is at 90 degrees. And, you know, Asus, to its credit, impressed us here. The reason it worked out is because there were perforations on the side panel or an option with the acrylic one to elevate it. And there's a small single fan in it, yes, but uh, it's at the back. It produces a negative pressure setup with combination from the turbo style card here where you have just uh, a, a squirrel cage fan pushes air out. So it all works together in a way that is actually surprisingly, it's not like good, but it's, it's surprisingly good for the, the combination of parts that we have in the case. Now in terms of big problems, the biggest one is just that loose screw. We've seen these in a few pre-builds now. You know, it's, it's hard to know for sure to what extent that's caused by shipping versus caused by maybe chronic under torquing conditions at the assembly plants or poor packing materials. This didn't have good packing, whereas something like the cyber power systems we've worked with have had probably some of the best packaging that we've seen. So it, it's hard for us to know exactly to what extent the packaging affects the screws being loose or not versus other factors just because we don't see it at the factory before it goes out the door. So with that in mind, uh, perhaps the best thing to do is when you get a new pre-built computer, pick it up, shake it around a little bit and see if you hear any rattling. But in this one, that was the biggest mistake we saw. The system's pretty unpleasant to use at this point. The, so the bloatware, Asus, you, you really screwed it up with the bloatware because it, it's otherwise an okay computer. The fan curve was pretty competent when we got it out of the box. You run Armory Crate once uh, to get rid of it, by the way, like open it to rid of it. And then it, it runs forever and it's always gonna open up. And uh, because that's of course what you want and then it updates something without you knowing and the next thing you know, the fan curve just jumps to 100% RPM uh, after maybe 20 seconds. So that aspect really sucked at this thing where it became unpleasant. It's noisy. You could control this manually as the end user, but a lot of people buying pre-builds, especially like this one, where it's not catered towards an enthusiast user, they're not going to know that you can fix that problem or they're going to be afraid to or they're worried about the warranty or the extra steps, whatever. So the fan curve needs to be done better. So that's it for this one. Asus did not deeply offend us. That's the award it gets alongside the it's better than Dell award that we somewhat generously give out because you know Dell's pretty far down from what we've looked at so far. So uh, overall, not bad. It's not what we would default to. We did enjoy working with the ABS Challenger more. We found it to be better overall. ABS has some pretty bad looking systems too. So can't blanket apply it across the whole line. Uh, the Lenovo Legion was somewhat competitive in some places, but very incompetently built in others. They're all over the place. So uh, it's okay. It's not something we would default to. It is, however, acceptable overall. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameraxis.net. If you'd like to grab one of the teardown toolkits, one of the mod mats, or one of our many other things that we have on the store, Thank you for watching and for supporting. We'll see you all next time.